Korean. Mm -hmm. Naipa. Naipa. <laughs> That's basically what I said the first time I heard it. That's funny. Well, I checked my Facebook. Ain't nobody said nothing to me. I don't think so. I think that was information they didn't know. So it probably was a shock to them to, to even hear that. Um, I think it goes back to what I was saying too. They've just been so busy trying to find fault somewhere, and it isn't. Like they just keep trying to. Well, what about this? What about that? Yeah. If you just take five seconds to look at not just what it is, but who it is that you're trying to present it to, and then take another five seconds to, to think about what they're going to say, you probably wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the thing about it is, like you said earlier, that people are always looking for something wrong all the time. And, it, and you know, we don't think in these terms, but even if somebody did something that was wrong in February, if they repented, that was it. They if they repented, it's, it's, it, over. it's over with. If they did it February first and they repented and said they were sorry February second, yeah, it's, you, yeah it, it, it's over with. It, it's it's done. You know, and you have to. And what you do is you gotta you gotta deal with it yourself how you deal with the situation. Case in point, all the mess that happened at PTL. And that happened not too long after we moved here. And yeah, that and the Jimmy Swaggart thing. Um, because you know, as Christians we have to we have to deal with things when they happen. And I can remember I remember things that were happening prior to us moving here. Well, we moved here four months before he turned two. We were born the same month. So we moved here four months before I turned 36. And so um, I remember some things were happening. Um, PTL was in Tarboro. TBN wasn't at the time. And so that and um, the 700 Club, uh, CBN, you had CBN. The Christian Broadcasting Network and PTL, they were the only two networks that were on cable in, in Tallboro. And so um, maybe a year or so before we moved here, I remember, if I remember correctly, it may have been RS, but somebody was wanting to look at the books. And I can remember Jim Baker, you know, making a defiant statement about People won't go be poking around looking at certain things. But I didn't see it when it happened. But um, maybe around that time or a year before, Mar Cirillo had been up on PTL. And he had written two books. And I'm not sure which book had been written at the time. I think he wrote the book, A Shaking Was Coming. It was coming to the church. And I think it was the last book he wrote was The Shaking Has Started. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go back and check. We got one of them here. Mm -hmm. Over there, over there. I don't think anybody got that book. I think it's still it's over there right now. I don't have it. In the library. So you ain't got that one. No, no, you got the, the nice leather bound book. Um, because this is a very small book. There's some people call it a booklet. It's not, it might be that big. But the first book was called A Shaking Was Coming. Then the next book was A Shake, The Shaking Had Started. And you know, God said, What? Before I judge the world, what? I gotta come to the church. And so I didn't see that episode of PTL, but I know that God sent him there and he gave a message to the body of Christ. But I also believe that Morris is giving a message to Jim. Mm -hmm. And so I say within a year or two, that's when all the mess broke loose. But um, 
really what they did was they overbooked them rooms. If you were like a lifetime subscriber, part of what you got was you got X number of days that you didn't have to pay at the at the hotel there, the, the, the resort. That you got it, it was free because you know you took a certain amount, so they just let you stay there so many days a year for nothing. And what they pretty much have done is what hotels will do. Now, I'm not making an excuse for it, but everybody knows mm -hmm. hotels were overbooked mm -hmm. a lot of times. Like airlines were overbooked. Mm -hmm. And they're overbooked. And essentially, you had a lot of folk that thought that they were supposed to be there and they didn't have enough rooms. Mm -hmm. So now, th now there was some malfeasance. That, uh, but see, that's it. Anytime you, like I was talking to you guys earlier, anytime you got a staff, man, you 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 got to like, you don't want to micromanage, but you got to have somebody mm -hmm. to watch people because mm -hmm. people, they have a tendency, because let's face it, Christians will do wrong, but a lot of times everybody works for you ain't saved. So you're going to get people, they're going to have access, and the Bible says what? For the love of money is real of all evil. So people have access to to money and or things. Anything can't go down and does. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, but really essentially what happened with BTL, that was a setup. I tell people Jim Baker was set up. It was it was a setup. There was a woman in New York that was a madam, and she said straight up, Jessica Hahn used to work for me. She said, she said, I, she admitted I, I was a madam. And she said she was part of my girls. So the thing about it is, is they made up a story, you know, to, to make it sound worse. Oh, she was a virgin when she got there and all this different stuff. But it's like anything else. What really hurt wasn't that the Jessica Hahn thing happened. It was the cover up. Mm -hmm. You come out better to go ahead and admit something went down and you get it done. It's when they started paying out money to cover it up. But it was a setup. That thing was a setup. It was set up to destroy the ministry so somebody else could come in there and take that thing. And it almost worked. It didn't quite work out like they thought it was going to work. And then it caused a lot of problems. But like I've told people, just like with the Jimmy Swaggart thing, um, I used to watch Jimmy Swagger every Sunday. I used to watch him through the week because his ministry was so big, you could catch Jimmy Swagger at different times of the day because he would have, he had a Bible school and everybody was a scholar. They had their PhDs, THDs, the Doctor of Divinities that were the, the teachers at his school. And he would panel and moderate and they would go over biblical questions. And it was really good to, to see them going back and forth. So I would catch that a lot of times. But but you could catch him with his other program. And then on Sunday, the Crusades, when he would preach. And so you could you could watch Jimmy Swagger seven days a week almost. And so um, he got to talking. And he was talking about people need to take a child molester. All child molesters. Line up on the wall and blow him away with the shotgun. Yeah. So I said, yeah, he's a father. So he's talking like a father would. But I said, Lord, he shouldn't be saying that. I said, that ain't nothing but flesh. Because you're talking about shooting people. Now, in the natural, yes, any father or grandfather want to do that. You know, if anybody would molest their child or the, or, the, or the grandchild. And as a man, I understood that. But as a minister of the gospel, yeah, you, you can't go before literally millions of people around the world and say that. So when he said it, it messed with me so bad that I stopped watching it for maybe a year or longer. And the Lord spoke to me and told me, said, watch Jimmy Swaggart. So 
I told my wife about it. And we tuned into Jimmy Swagger. And guess what? He was still talking about them child molesters being blown up on the wall and blown away with a shotgun. I said, man, good gracious, that's something that's wrong. So you shouldn't be saying that. And so prior to that, I heard him fussing and arguing about people doing ridiculous things like sending people pieces of their tie and, and telling them to use that as a prayer cloth. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. No, it wasn't ridiculous. He was jealous. Because one of those three people I talked about earlier, earlier, mm -hmm. you know, was doing I know that. one of them did. Yeah. Yeah, the one you saw and God used him to mm -hmm. grow, grow out a foot, mm -hmm. grow out a leg. God was using him in that. So I knew who he was talking about. And I said, Lord, that's that's not that's not you. That's him. That's flesh. That's jealousy. He's jealous of the healing that that individual has. Mm -hmm. But the thing that always bothered me was this individual was raised Pentecostal. So the Bible says we're all qualified. Like, it's like that's like what you were talking, we were talking about in the other video. <laughs> when you get saved, Jesus gives you a certain amount of power. But he had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why wasn't he regularly praying for people? That was one aspect of his ministry he did not do. Mm -hmm. And that's his fault because he knew the Bible well enough to know it. But see, a lot of people, and they do this stuff on purpose. They don't want to pray for the sick because they don't want to deal with criticism. See, they get criticized so bad. Everybody loved Billy Graham and folk hated Oral Roberts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Oral Roberts prayed for the sick. And so there was lies controversy. But, the, but how, how can that be? It's the word. So how can an individual who was raised Pentecostal talks about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, knows what the Great Commission says, but you don't pray for the sick? See, that, that doesn't make sense. I can understand people raised Baptists like me or Presbyterian or Lutheran because they don't advocate it. When you talk about Anytime you say that I preach the gospel or you say the full gospel, then Kratos is part of it for the, cre the creative aspect of it. Dunamis is there. All that's there. So how do you not pray for the sick? How do you not pray for the sick? So that was jealousy and strife that should not have been there. So I went like, hmm, man, I'm, I'm seeing stuff here that just shouldn't be here. So, okay, time passes. And so stuff comes out. And um, one morning I had this dream. It's a Sunday morning. And in the dream, I see Jimmy. And Jimmy is sitting, and I see all these women surrounding him. And I told my wife, I said, I just saw Jimmy Swagger. And I saw a bunch of women around him. Well, guess what? That's when he came on TV that morning and bust out in tears and confessed. But when I saw that dream, I said, that stuff must be true. The, the rumors that were circulating. And sure enough, I actually saw it for myself. So the thing about it is, is, but I've reminded people that have said, well, they're false prophets. I said, no, they're not. I said, God called both men to preach. They're both called. They're anointed. They're not false prophets. I said, they're men who have feet of clay and who have fallen. But they're not false prophets. And I said, so watch what you say about them. A bad decision doesn't nullify your call. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I said, then the Lord's anointed. I said, yes, what they did was wrong. I said, but it would be wrong of us not to forgive them if we said we got the love of Christ. And so when I told people, I said, they're called. Don't say they're false prophets. You're wrong. I said, so they're the Lord's anointed, so watch what you say about them. 
I said, yes, what they did was wrong. I said, but you can't call them false prophets. That's wrong. I said, God got his hand on them, and God's going to handle it. I said, so you watch what you say about them. And I've told I, I haven't had to do it a lot in the last maybe couple of years. But for many years, I had to tell people that when they would begin to get to a critical mode. I would tell them, I said, no, those are two guys calling God sent me in. I said, so watch what you say about them. Yes, what they did was wrong, but it's our obligation to forgive them. And so, don't you know that God, we see in this Bible, that God rebuked people while he was in the midst of doing, using them. So it's not like stuff doesn't go down. I told you about George Bloom. I was, I was glad how he, he looked in the camera and said, I asked you to forgive me and uh, pray for me. You, you can respect stuff like that. Yeah, I, I did. I, I gained a, a great deal of respect because <coughs> he said the Lord rebuked him. And told him, he said, you, you built up George Bloomer and George Bloomer's name, not mine. You know, so, and he admitted it. Like you say, that being transparent about that having to happen. And so, even if folk have done stuff that's wrong, it's, it's my obligation to forgive them. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we do is that we uh, kill our wounded. We don't do things to try to, to lift them up <laughs> and help them. <coughs> you do, use it. We use a finishing blow. Yeah. That finishing blow in the down, you know, um, we try to finish them, try to, try to kill them. And um, that's one of the things in the body of Christ that people need to understand is that if you see some wrongdoing, you need to pray for your brother or sister. Now, if you know them personally, yeah, you need to call them out. But there's a way to even do that. You don't have to always do it publicly. You can pull them over to the side and talk to them. They might break salt, but you can get them straight. But if possible, let there be what? One or two witnesses. You know, so a thing can be established at times. But there may be times when, <clears throat> excuse me, God will have you do it just one on one. But that's one thing we got to understand is even if fault is found, you still got to forgive people. And I know it's not always easy because you feel that betrayal and you feel that sting. I'm not saying that's not so. But it's always a challenge to us how we act when stuff goes down. So let that be a lesson to everybody, all of us that are in the body of Christ. Um, I think sometimes too, if you tell people about <coughs> how they've dealt with you personally, you can tell them what you did was wrong, you know, toward me. Whereas you were in a dire straits, you show up for prayer. But then after prayers happen and you get delivered, you don't show up anymore. You know, you, you cut off fellowship, especially when you know that person was used to help you and bless you. You know, it's, it's almost like that old thing where, you know, well, I'm in a tight and let me go here and get this prayer. And now I done got delivered. So but see you mm. kind of thing. You know, I could see it being different. You know, if um, you live certain X amount, number of miles away. But when you're local, it, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to just stay away and see but what here's what happened with people though mm. we respect the persons and we, we're very situational uh there was a woman i had to rebuke her because she would decide she'd just go off and get her boyfriend and god ain't had nothing to do with the boyfriend that was her in her flesh going to get her man she trying to get her some money let's just call it what it was and every time she would get into a witchcraft mess every time looking for that dollar bill and so i had to rebuke her i said look you know you can't keep doing this I said because what you're doing is you keep going off the lord deliver you come in for prayer get delivered then you still run off and try to find somebody 
and get in more mess. I said, I said, it's not right. I said, I'm not going to continue to wrestle with devils on your behalf because you won't do the right thing. You're going out in your flesh and trying to find somebody instead of getting before the Lord and allowing it to happen. So every time you go out, you get into a mess. And so, because see, people, people will try to pimp the gift. People try to pimp your ministry. This is what they'll do. They'll pimp it if they can. Because they're looking at, you know why? They're looking for blessing. In their mind, that's all they're trying to get. All the money and the material they can get. They really ain't trying to get their spirit and soul blessed. They want their hands blessed. They want a certain amount of money and material goods. And sometimes you got to let folk know, you know, this is not going to work. You know, it just ain't going to happen. Especially when you keep going out here and running into these devils. And here you come now for me to pray them off of you. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And you have to like, get folks straight. Um, but yeah, it's one of the biggest problems in the body of Christ is, is that we don't have, a, we really don't manifest real love for each other. I mean, that's all it really boils down to. And like I said again, if people are found in a fault, somebody wants to press your neck to the ground. I remember visiting the church. I was backslidden at the time. Not too long before I uh, came back to the Lord, and a girl uh, was single and had gotten pregnant in the church. She was raised in the church. And she was raised in a, a holiness Pentecostal church. It was at Faith Tabernacle outside of Rocky Mountain. And so, naturally, you know, she was ashamed. And uh, one deacon was really working with her. Uh, he wanted to come back to church. He said, he, said, he said, you know, ain't no need to let that stop you from coming back to the church. And so she came up and she actually apologized. You know, it took a lot of, a lot of gumption for her to do that. But there was one real pious deacon hmm. who was against it. They got to a little shout match, though. It, it, it didn't escalate as bad as I thought it would have. But they got to a, they, the two deacons got to a shout match about it in front of everybody. But you know, he, this deacon who was who spoke out against it after the girl apologized, what else was she supposed to do? You know, so that's the whole thing about people. They get real vindictive and they really get mean. And they consider themselves being holy, you know. But where's your compassion? You know, you should. He should have been glad the girl came back to church. But no, I don't know what he really wanted her to do. But he was not satisfied that she came. She went before the church in the Sunday morning meeting and apologized. What what more was she supposed to do? I don't know what the, you know what was in his mind, but uh, honest, sincere apology. And you know it was embarrassing to her to do that. But he was so religious that he was upset about it. So you know, again, where's the compassion? Again, the woman who was brought before Jesus, and I still say, where was the man? You're going to say the woman was caught in the very act where she was having sexual relations with the man. Where was the man? So you got the double standards. They're going to, going to put the woman up. They, they, they would have stoned her. That's what it was. They were trying to get Jesus to say the woman deserved to be stoned to death. But where was the man? Oh, she was caught in the very act. Oh, y'all caught her, but you couldn't catch the man. So that goes to show the hypocrisy right there. And I believe that's one of the reasons, too, why Jesus just grabbed him a stick and just went to sketching in the dirt. And he just kept scratching in the dirt. And he said, what? He who was without sin, let them cast the first stone. And everybody got on the conviction. And he just kept scratching on the dirt. And slowly but surely, the mob left. And Jesus looked up and he said to the woman, he said, why are you accusers? He said, said uh, well, there are none. He said, well, I feel the same way. Go away and sin no more. <clears throat> hmm. 
we have to learn how to forgive people. It can be a challenge. I'm not going to say it's always easy. And I don't mind admitting to people, there were times I had to turn my plate down. Because I can tell you, I had a very fierce temper. And I can still find him down in there somewhere. You know, he, he, he doesn't come to the fore as quickly. But he's down in there, and you have to keep him suppressed. <coughs> Sometimes to keep that flesh suppressed, you have to, like, turn your plate down and spend hours before the Lord. Um, and one thing you do is you learn how not to keep thinking about it. But I was kind of person that if the more I think about it, the better I got. Same here. You know that's so that's so you know, you have to be real honest about that kind of stuff. So you have to learn how to forgive people. It ain't easy. I'm not saying it always is. <coughs> Devil will try you, but you know, but you have to practice it. And so, <coughs> excuse me. That's one of the, the challenges as a Christian is that if people do wrong, then you still got to forgive them. And I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm not always saying it. It's, you know, it feels like it, it rubs up against you because your flesh said, I didn't tell it behind enough. You know, especially when they've done a personal affront to you. And you have to, you know, have to suppress it. Now, you know, the great cusser who was, who was Peter. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, but when he won the Son of Thunder. <laughs> You know, uh, that's why he got into a conversation with Jesus. Jesus told you you're supposed to, you're supposed to forgive people 70 times 7 a day. And that's a lot of forgiveness. So Jesus say it's just blanket. And that's that's what we got to do. So if somebody does something wrong, if they repent it, you got to leave it alone. They sincerely repent before the Lord. You let the Lord handle it. You let the Lord handle it. Even if they've done wrong and still doing wrong, if it's something you know that they were doing in January and here it is December and they're still doing it, <clears throat> the Lord may speak to you about it. The Lord may tell you to say something to them. Or the Lord may say pray for them. But watch what you say against them. Because it's still the Lord's anointed. And he says, what? Venice is mine. I will repay. And he says, I will repay. That's right. So you still got to watch how you handling that. Because it's up to him to bring it. He's the righteous judge. And we don't know how much uh, grace has been given to that person. So we can't, we can't judge. This is what people misappropriate the term judge. Because when we speak of judge in the Bible, we're talking about spiritually uh, figuring things out, reasoning it out in the spirit. But see, God is righteous judge. So, Lord, may tell you to say something to him about it. Lord, may tell you to pray about it. But God didn't tell you to go behind their back and just keep, you know, it's, <laughs> unless it's a situation where that person may be defrauding someone and you know that they may defraud somebody. That's different. But, you know, you just don't go around telling so-and-so and so doing so-and-so and so. You know, you don't necessarily tell everything like that. You pray about it and you use some discretion. Because this is stuff that you always got to deal with with people in the church. <clears throat> because my wife talked about she was raised in a church here in Greensboro, Hazel Moore, not a holy church of America. And, and uh, she didn't know nothing that was going on. But somebody that, that she knew that joined the church, I guess as a young adult, knew all the gossip in the church. But the Bible talks about gossipers. And it's not in good terms. The Lord said he despises folk that gossip. Because you stir stuff up. Whether it's real or not. You know, the, the wagging lips. And, <clears throat> and see... If you gossip it, you could kill somebody's reputation and they, they could be 100% innocent. But you spread and stuff out. And I, I tell people, you kill people with the tongue. The Bible says, what? This is a vile organ. Dangerous. Even during World War II, they had the expression, loose lips sink ships. 
you know? So you can kill a person with your mouth. You can kill their reputation. And that's murder. So that's just as vile as taking a gun or a knife to someone. But people don't think about that in those terms. And they say things about people. You need to watch how you poison somebody's identity. You have to stop thinking about, you have to be wise about what you say about people. If you know that they're bad in business dealings and might defraud somebody, then you may be something you need to say. But a lot of times then, God may want you to pray about that person. Pray about what they're doing. So a lot of times, use wisdom and start praying about situations instead of always getting on the telephone or, or texting people, you know. Think about it. There's, there's ways to approach these things. And if we pray and ask the Lord to show us what to do, we'll always have the right answer. Because sometimes God will say, well, you're going to tell them, but they're not going to listen to you, but at least they'll be able to say, well, in March, you told me about it. So when the Lord visited them in June or July, they can stop and go like, uh-oh. The Lord did, did tell me before it went down. Because I truly believe what, what happened to Jim Baker. I bet he looked back at when Marcin Rowe came by and said about that shaking. Mm -hmm. I bet he thought about it. Because you know how it is. The Lord will wait till something goes down it's just you and him. And then he'll start talking to you. And then he'll say, didn't I tell you so and so and so? I had a similar situation today. Um, there was a guy that uh, I felt that the Lord was going to use to to help me out, you know, with a project. And we talked and he said he was going to do a certain thing for me. And when it came down to it, he didn't do it. So instead of jumping to conclusions, I gave it some time because I'm thinking maybe something happened or, you know, maybe it was something else. But I gave it almost a month and he still never said anything. So instead of, you know, slandering his name and, you know, going to other people and say, don't deal with him, all this other stuff, I just went to him. You know, I went to him and I said, you know, what I said. And from there, the sad part was I saw, because I sent it to him in a Facebook message, I saw that he saw the message, but he never said anything. Mm -hmm. But from there, it was easier to wipe my hand, wash my hands of it because it's like I said my piece. I said, you know, what I had against them, but I've, you know, I've been able to move on now. Now, from there, it's on him now. You know, he he saw it. I said what I needed to say. He still didn't say anything, but, you know, that's up to him. But instead of, you know, going around gossiping, I just went straight to him and said what I needed to say, and mm -hmm. now I feel better about it. Well, see, that's good because you, you talk with him. See, so he can't say that you didn't get it straight with him. I, I think a lot of times that's the that's the thing that we don't approach it the way the Lord says to do it. Um, it says, "What well, if you have all against your brother? Go to him." And sometimes it's a misunderstanding. But sometimes you know exactly what the deal is, but it's to let them know I know what's going down. Sometimes people are so arrogant they think you don't see it. And so when you tell them about it, whether they will admit it or not, see, that absolves you of blood on your hands because that helps to bring a release to you. Now that person doesn't have as, that right to try to clean and try to you know, come against you. You told them. So now it's up to them. And sometimes, believe it or not, that can be so much more powerful because that sets it up to where it's on them now. They got to get it right for the Lord. You know, because see, God a lot of times tell people to give restitution. He'll tell people, yeah, you know, what you did was wrong. And you you messed up so and so and so with this person. So I'm telling you, you need to do this and that to get it right. But uh, you see very little of people admitting those things and actually uh, carrying stuff out like they should. Um, it's commendable that you actually took it to him because 
it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen uh, biblically a lot of times like it should have. Um, did you want to continue on what we had been talking about? Did you want to, uh, you know, the Lord's got us talking about this because this, I mean, this people need to understand. You got to forgive people. All of us have been betrayed by somebody at some time or another. And it's just one of those things where we just have to forgive people. Like I said, it's not always easy. You might have to turn your plate down and do a whole lot of morning prayer or whatever. But um, we have we have to do that. Because you know, if the person sin today and ask God at 12 or 5 at night to forgive them, and they were sincere, God has forgiven them. So you got to, too. So, you should be praying about being able to discern if people are sincere. Because I do know we live in the time of the, of the half apology, if it's half. Um, I quote somebody who said something years ago, if I said something to you to offend you, I'm sorry. That wasn't a real, that's not a real apology. You know, that's, that's you know, because to me, you're still being smug. Still being, still being smart. Mm, it's, it's, like, it's your fault that you got mad. Yeah, yeah, you just got mad because I said something. You know, and it's, it's obvious that you weren't speaking the gospel. You were speaking how you felt about something. How y'all how sitting there? It made you feel some kind of way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, uh, no, what it is is what you said was just wrong. And you, you, you want to give that apology, no apology, which I find a lot of people are doing. They're doing that on purpose now. They'll make some outlet. Now you know Scalia has not said anything. He had he has an apology because he really feels that way. He's just racist. Mm -hmm. um, so he hasn't even given the apology, which is no apology. But I think he thought about. Huh? But see again, that's that arrogance. Mm -hmm. But he's made himself look really stupid by doing it. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with him over the next few months. Um, but no, I've noticed that the enemy is causing people to make. Uh, racist statements, then they come back with the apology, no apology. You know, um, I saw on Facebook where one woman approached some Arabs and shoved one and threw some hot coffee on another one. So she thinks her privilege tells her that she can assault people. Now, now they were out in, a, I think, a public park, and I think they might have been praying. But Stopping by and saying insulting things to people and harassing folk, that's not going to make it. But you got a certain amount of the population. They think that they're going to do things that way. It ain't going to work because it's flesh. So people's best bet is to humble themselves before the Lord and look for God to take care of it. Because, well, again, vengeance is mine. Um, it just doesn't work that way. God, God has a his own system of checks and balances. And we don't always agree with how God does it, but let's put it this way. When he handles it, it's taken care of. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we don't see the wisdom in it. But this way, people ain't got you in their crosshairs and you ain't sitting downtown being interrogated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a lot of times, uh, you gotta fix it so you have an alibi or something crazy goes down. You know, somebody will see you, or you went by to get something and they got your own videotape that you can prove it so and so and so time where you were. You know how it is in the movies and TV. Where were you at 8 o'clock Sunday night uh, watching TV? Yeah. Was anybody with you? No. Know? That kind of thing. Gotta fix it. So you'll either have guests over at your house or you'll be on your landline mm -hmm. or something like that. Gotta fix it. So there'll be a, a time stamp somewhere. So when something crazy go down, they just you know, check you right off the list. You know? So um, we just really need to be more more loving to people. Man, just, just, not, just not another love in the body of Christ. I mean, that's just one of the biggest problems that I've found for years is people don't have a real love of Christ. I, I listen to some people when they give their testimonies and they talk about the people that they're around, um, the pastors or the mentors, and they actually were around people who had to love the God. But you got, but you got a lot of them. They don't have it. Right. 
And it's one of the biggest fallacies within the within the uh, body of Christ. What did you what did you want to talk about? Oh <clears throat> I mean you say you open I'm, yeah, I was over here listening to uh the whole forgiveness thing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna graduate hard. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, heart, yeah, because I mean, you, you, when you have to, I mean, because that's the that's the whole thing about it is 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 uh, it's still something I'm still learning, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like this again: if folk done jacked up in January, but they done got it right by June, even if they did something that was wrong, you gotta forgive them. Mm -hmm. You know that that's that's it. If if they sincerely ask God to forgive them, then you just gotta let that go. I mean, that's just how it is. If they have if they ain't repented, then you got another thing coming. Then you say, well, wait a minute, this person uh, is still, as you say, wilding out, mm -hmm. and uh, now you got to pray about. You know, if you have to come in contact with them, how are you gonna handle them? You have to pray there too about Lord, how do I give this message to somebody asking about that person? Mm -hmm. You know, to give me wisdom about how I'm gonna talk about what is it you revealed unto me. I I know where we can go. The uh this in Matthew twenty four. Talking about discerning the times. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the Lord was the Lord was saying that to me about um, you know, with the whole discernment conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like part of it is like you gotta discern you gotta discern the times. Um you gotta discern what what uh <coughs> what hour you're living in so that you're making the right moves at the right time. Matthew yes, sir. <clears throat> and uh, man, this is a lot we can uh, we can read about. But let's see here. Um, let's start at verse thirty-five. Um. I'm so it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not only, uh, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, rather. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that uh, were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until that day. That Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood it came and it took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm gonna stop right there. So, one of the things that the Lord was talking to me about mm -hmm. regarding discernment was He reminded me that that the Word is a discern. So, Jesus is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, intents of the heart. heart. And then I start thinking about like relationships, right? And the Lord was reminding me that, that he just said it real, real simple. He was like, the reason I come that a lot of these relationships, like they flake is because they're not based on the word. It's like if Jesus or if the word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, if, if the word, if your concept of who you're dealing with isn't based on the word, then it's not real. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, because the word is a discern. How do you, here's exactly what I said. I said to myself, I was like, I'm finally in a mature space where I'm only concerned what's in a chick's head and what's in a chick's heart. And then the Lord was like, well, that's good because the my word is the discern of the thoughts and intents of her heart. And then I was like, wow. So I was like, so that means that if, if my dealings with her ain't based on the word, then I'm not going to know what's in her heart. You know what I'm saying? It's like you can't know what's in somebody's heart because if it ain't based on the word because the word is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when we talk about 
the relationship paradigm, the reason how come, because the thing, like bump, bump unsaved people for a split second. The reason why uh, relationships in the church are so off is because we've adopted a lot of the world's philosophy, a lot of the wisdom of the world concerning relationships. And the reason how come that um, that's a bad look is because everything regarding relationships in the world is from a fallen state. When you read, you know what I'm saying, like whenever Adam and Eve ate the fruit and God judged them, one of the very first things that was broken was the relationship between Adam and Eve. Whenever Adam got, whenever Eve got caught, no, whenever Adam got caught, Adam blamed Eve. Whenever Eve got caught, she blamed the serpent. You know what I'm saying? And that space, and it was right after that, whenever God judged everybody in their order. He judged the serpent first, then he judged Eve, then he judged Adam. And he was like, when he was talking to Eve, he was like, well, see, because you did what you did, now you have to be your husband's, uh, your, your husband's going to have a rule over you. You know what I'm saying? And like, so, so the, because up until that point, they were, you know what I'm saying? Like, like she was his help me. Now, here's the beautiful thing about getting married in Christ your wife is your help me. You know what I'm saying? I'm by no means like preaching. Yeah, I ain't preaching no misogyny or anything crazy like that. Together. The, uh, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like the original paradigm. But the but the problem with, with most Christians in the church is that we've adopted a lot of these. We've adopted a, a relationship paradigm that's broken, that's fallen. You know what I'm saying? It's dysfunctional. And... Um, that's how come, and, and, and the biggest thing is, is that people's vision of how relationships supposed to, are supposed to go, they aren't built on the word. So that's how come that people, that's how come that the male and the, and the female, they're not working together as one because they're not, uh, they're not discerning what's in each other's hearts. They really don't know what's in each other's hearts. And the reason I come to that's even relevant to that passage we just read is because it said for as in uh, the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Whenever we go back and we study that, that period in history, um, before God sent the flood, first off, talking about discerning the times, we're living in what the nerds call post-modernity, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we're also, so post-modernity as it pertains to Christianity is we're basically like 10 minutes before like the Illuministic agenda, which is to, uh, I'm going to slow down and take my time because it's so much. Yeah. All right. All right. So the days of Noah, we got to, so now we got to go to it. Now we got to go to Genesis, the sixth chapter. And it also helps, you know what I'm saying, to cop a book of Enoch, a book of Jubilees, and a book of Jasher. Because this is crazy, man. This is, when we talk about conspiracies and conspiracy theories, or conspiracy, I'm a conspiracy realist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um... This right here, the days of Noah, this is where this is where we're dealing with. It says that it came to pass that when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And the sons of God in this passage are the Benai or Benai Elohim, meaning the sons of God, meaning uh, angels that were watchers, watcher angels, because like they're different kinds of angels. And the watcher angels were... Uh, their job was to come and teach mankind righteousness. You know what I'm saying? Well, you see that in the book of Jasher, like this. Uh, and they decided they would leave their first estate, like it says in the book of Jude. And it says, And the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of which they chose. And the Lord said, Now check this out. And the Lord said that my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. And, and so there were giants in the earth in those days. So there were giants in the earth. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and when they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which are 
who are old and men of renown. And the biggest thing is God saw the wickedness of man. It was great nerve and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God rethought about making man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. Then he said, I'm going to kill everybody. Now, most people think that um, a lot of atheists and agnostics, people who don't understand uh, the righteous judgment of God, they get mad at God. But here's what they don't understand. The reason I come to God had to destroy that generation of human beings was because the human genome had been corrupted by De, de, by demonic, by demonic, uh, demonically hybrid uh, DNA. With these fallen angels, and the Book of Enoch really delves into this. But what these fallen angels did was, they said, "Yo, we saw, we saw that woman in heaven in the Book of the Revelation. You know, saying was pregnant with a child." Mm -hmm. And then she gave birth to the son who was supposed to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And then the dragon tried to attack the child. And then God caught the child up to his throne. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they basically saw the immaculate conception in heaven, right? Which is Jesus being born, da, da, da. And they said they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to make mankind in their own image. And so they came to earth and they started sleeping with women. And they start having these things called giants or Nephilim. Um, and the reason why this is important, we're talking about discerning the times, uh, archaeologists have been uncovering uh, giant skeletons for years now, like years now, e basically ever since archaeology be like became an official science. Because here's one of the things that they don't tell you about, because everything has become uh, secularized as we moved into post-modernity. Um, archaeology started in modernity. And uh, it was initially brought about, and it was it was called the field of Bible archaeology because they were using that. yeah because they were using archaeology basically to back up. They were like, well, yo, if all of this like okay, if the Tower of Babel existed, that means there's got to be some ancient site somewhere in the desert over there in the Middle East where there's a bunch of rocks that look like the remains of a tower, and so. Um, in the process of going to find out all of this, obviously the field became heavily secularized um, after the myth of the Darwinian paradigm was introduced. And whenever Dar when the Darwinian paradigm was introduced, here here lies the problem. Uh, this demonic idea basically hit the reset button on all creation and acted like the creation account in Genesis didn't count. You know what I'm saying? They 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 replaced it. So so, so according to the Jewish calendar, the Earth's really only been around about six thousand years. But it wasn't until this Darwinian nonsense came into be that people started talking about ten thousand years ago, twenty thousand years millions. ago, millions of years, and things like carbon dating, which has already been scientifically debunked. It's like yo. That was fake science, you know what I'm saying? But people still use that nomenclature because Satan is the father of lies, right? Okay, and when we talk about every false religion on the planet, and see, this this is very important that we as Christians know this because we know how to, by us knowing the root, we know how to talk with people who are other various theological persuasions. So the first uh, instance of false religion that came to planet Earth was whenever Eve had the conversation with the serpent, right? That was the first, and that was Gnosticism, right? Right. Okay. Immediately after that, okay, so that was in Genesis the third chapter. Well, three chapters later in Genesis the sixth chapter, that's whenever these idiots, these watcher angels come down, and you that's why you gotta read the book of Enoch. Because the book of Enoch explains how these fallen angels came down and see in all of this. All of this is sound doctrine, is gospel, because the Bible says in Revelation, the 12th chapter, that Satan, right, one, one archangel, right, he took a third of the angels of heaven with him. It says that his tail grabbed a third of the stars in heaven, and they were flung, they were flung to earth with him, right? You know what I'm saying? It says that Michael, it says Michael and his angels, which was the other two-thirds of, 
with the angels of heaven, fought with the dragon and his angels, right? Mm -hmm. And Michael beat all them jokers down, right? Mm -hmm. And then they were cast to earth. Okay, well, did. Um, the first instance, the false religion was like I said with Adam, excuse me, with Adam and Eve dealing with the serpent, believing that nonsense. The second instance, and this is the most important one, was the one that happened in Genesis, the sixth chapter, where the fallen, where the watcher angels, uh, not only did they um, did they have sex with these women and create giants, jokers thirty feet tall, you know what I'm saying? Uh, deformed humans, basically. Anything regarding, and we talked about this when we was over at Maxi Beach, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mythological mm -hmm. creatures ain't mythological creatures, right. you know what I'm saying? Uh, they taught mankind how to make weapons, you know what I'm saying? Intimity. Yeah, the intimidating, yeah, the beautification of the eyelids, all the crazy stuff. But, but let's talk about weapons for a split second, because uh, every false religion teaches that extraterrestrials or aliens, right, came down and they taught mankind all this crazy stuff. In fact, a lot of false religions teach that these aliens actually created mankind. So see, once again, we have a false okay, cosmological see how that can all come out of that. Exactly. Okay. So one of the um one of the things that we know just from being students of history is this. And the Bible says this first. Okay. The Bible talks about, um, it just says here, it says that, it says that everything was corrupted. It talks about how, um, it says the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. That's verse, uh, that's verse 11. It says, God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. What that means is, is that with this now demonically, hybrid DNA on the planet. The human genome is polluted. And so that means that everybody <laughs> everybody was part devil. I know it sounds funny, but it's the truth. Because these these uh these women had sex with these demons, created giants. Now the giants are having sex with more human beings. And and this this Fallen DNA is being spread out through the entire earth. So that's eventually going to water down and wipe out the original human exactly. DNA makeup. So this is how come that the Bible says Noah in in the in verse nine it says in verse eight it says but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and it says these are the generations of Noah. It says that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. That don't mean that Noah did everything right, you know what I'm saying, in terms of like his relationship. It don't mean that he was perfect that way. No, it meant that he and them eight, uh, he and them seven other people, meaning his three sons, their wives, his wife, right? They were the only people left on the planet that didn't have that corrupted DNA. Yo, you know what I just realized? And and this is, is a discovery, but kind of also in the form of a question. All right, if the Nephilim, the women were having sex with the fallen angels, which were creating the Nephilim, the giants, and the giants in turn, they're coming back around and having sex with more humans. Right, right. Well, after a while, that wiped out the pure human genome. And everything. Right, right. Well, God had to press reset on life, wipe all of that out, literally start over again. Well, now that Jesus is about to come back again and we're towards the end of it all, mm -hmm. I can now, and I guess it's still kind of a, a question, see now, okay, prime example with the LGBT movement, where if, because homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender, all these different things is being pushed so heavily more now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. And there are so many men and women that are gay and homo, uh, gay and lesbian now. If enough of us were to turn that way that they're advocating, advocating so hard, that can drastically decrease the human population because if men are sleeping with other men and women are sleeping with other women, that means other men and women aren't being created anymore. Exactly. 
at, at least from the start of it, they're not being created at the rate that they once were. But then after a while, you get that happening and then transgender and then it, it just really goes downhill. And God hasn't revealed, I guess, enough of this to me as far as what's going to happen. But I can see kind of a, a parallel between now and what happened back then with all of the things that were happening back then and even now with uh, modern science, with uh, gene splicing and, and all these other things. It's like they're still, in a sense, now trying to do what, what happened back then. They're trying to be, we're trying to be God. These scientists are trying to be God and, and they couldn't create it in and of themselves. So they have to take creations mm -hmm. and then play creator on that. Right, right. They can't, they, they, they not stupid enough to realize it can't come from them, right. but they take creations mm -hmm. and then they manipulate those things. Right. Because God had already set humans here and he had created those angels as well. Those angels couldn't create the people who were already here, but they came and screwed up what was here already mm -hmm. to, in efforts to create something else. But there had to be something there first, just like a lie can't exist unless the truth exists. Right, right. A lie isn't a lie in the of itself. But I guess, did you see the question there? It was, it was a lot. It was wordy, but... I guess my question to you is, do you see like that parallel there? Like I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. what you're saying is opening up a lot for me and I'm beginning to like see a direct well, yeah, correlation. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The, the homosexual agenda is, is, is completely intentional and it, it is, it's a form of eugenics. It's designed to control the population because you're right. If you have, uh, if you, if you don't have heterosexual, uh, procreation happening, you can't put people on the earth. And the reason why that's so demonic is because every person that's exported from heaven to earth has a destiny. And that destiny is to build the kingdom of God. So if that person never gets to the planet, that means that there's a, that means that God has to, you know what I'm saying, deal with that. He, now he has to do something else. You know what I'm saying? Once yeah. again, it's, this, it's like this cosmic chess match between God and Satan. It's like, you know what I'm saying? God will make his move and then Satan will make his counter move, you know what I'm saying, try to throw stuff off. Because the thing about it is, uh, in the grand scheme of things, is that we know that Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, is that before Jesus comes back, the Antichrist is going to pop up. And the spirit of the Antichrist has already been released. There's some idiot in Russia, you know what I'm saying, the who's Syrian. walking around. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? He says that he's Jesus. Like, there are several people on the planet now that like, we can Google them. And they are telling people, and they have followings where they are saying that they are the Messiah. You know what I mean? But here's the thing that I want to talk about that's, like, really freaky, is that, first off, we got to understand, the Bible says that there were giants in the land. It says that there were giants uh in those days check this out though it says and also after that when the sons of god came into the daughters of men and they bear children unto them now the the most immediate uh uh analogy i can give you unfortunately it's a hollywood reference but the thing is is that we know that hollywood uh is 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 this is is the satanic arm of media you know what I'm saying? In terms of, you know, like really disseminating a lot of illuministic ideas to prepare people. Because the reason I come to movies are becoming increasingly more illuministic. Music is becoming increasingly more illuministic is to prepare people for the one world religion, because all of these symbols and all of these ideas are part of the one world religion. So by people watching music videos where they see a bunch of pyramids, inverted crosses, pentagrams, etc., you know what I'm saying? They're already being preconditioned so that whenever that stuff becomes a part of just normal society, it's like, oh, okay, I remember that. You know what I'm saying? That's what their subconscious mind will say. Well, the thing about these giants is that these giants, human beings never stop interacting with these giants. You know what I'm saying? When we talk about in Africa, you know what I'm saying? That was why the Egyptian empire was so great. As much as I love black people, and you know I love black people. You know I love black people. You know what I'm saying? The, man, black people didn't build the pyramids. 
And the Jews didn't build the pyramids either because the, the, the pyramids are held together by piezoelectricity. You know what I'm saying? To this day, they can't the, figure out right. how this stuff is The rocks is yeah. too big. But, but stop and think about this. If you 30 feet tall, I'm 30 feet tall, we could build some pyramids. Here, easy. put this over there. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, exactly. Legos. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Both boulders, pound bar, <laughs> Legos. Okay. So every ancient, okay, let's go back to that thing about these these demon spirits, these watcher angels. They taught mankind how to, uh, because the, the book of Enoch is very specific. It didn't say that they just taught them how to make weapons. Dig this. The it book of Enoch listed says. what they were. It, it says it taught them how to take the, uh, the minerals out of the earth. Human beings didn't know how to mine yet. Mm -hmm. they, they taught them how to mine and take the minerals out the earth then heat them mobs, you know what I'm saying? And and then forge the weapons, the vain secrets of heaven. So what is so let's just use a little 2015 logic. We already know that these demonic spirits desire worship. You know what I'm saying? Like these, these, and, and this is how come that every false religion has. So let's take the Incans, for example. The Incans, man. Like, first off, they believe their king was a god. And the, the, the common denominator between every ancient religion and every ancient system on the planet was that everybody had a cone head. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's first off, that's one of the, the biggest features of the Nephilim. The Nephilim are cone-headed, humanoid-type creatures, right? Okay, so, so when we talk about the concept of a god king, we're not talking about human beings. The pharaohs were not human. They weren't right. These were not normal people, right? These were Nephilim. So that's how come that they were worshipped as gods because they had superpowers that regular people didn't have. All right? Okay. So with, within the Incan and the Aztecs, right, what they would do was they would have these, uh, these festivals and they coincide with the same dumb calendar that we're on, this Greco-Roman nonsense, because the thing about these, these satanic calendars, they all got the same stupid holidays, right? So they would have, so for Halloween, right? They would literally sacrifice, human sacrifice, they would literally kill people all day and all night by taking, you remember on the Indiana Jones movie where, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, collar and eyes, taking yeah, people's, yeah. Yeah. Take, take their heart out. Heart. Yeah, they yeah. were literally snatching, they were literally cutting people's hearts uh, out of their chest while they were alive for blood sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? Remember, Satan is copying the blood of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that that works because the, the Bible says the life is in the blood. So if the, right. if the life of God is shed, you know what I'm saying? We're going to be straight, but Satan has copied that. And these demons require blood sacrifice. But check this out. Here's the exchange. If you worship, I'm going to speak as the Nephilim. I'm not being evil. So they, they said, if you if you will worship us, if you will do these blood sacrifices, if you'll kill these innocent people, in exchange, what we will give you is advanced technology. We will give you advanced ideas. Uh, let me let me fast forward. This is it's the same theological system, but what I'm purposely doing is I'm jumping from civilization to civilization so that you can see it's the same principalities and powers, the same the same rules of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. In the 1930s, this French dude decided to go. He was an astronomer. He decided to go to West Africa, which is present day. The the country he was in was Benin, right? The the homemade people, right? Now, if you Check out West African stuff, Yoruba stuff. The Dahomeys, that's some of the oldest voodoo on the continent. Some of the, some of the oldest and the most, okay. exactly. Okay. Some of the oldest and the most powerful. And see, this hits home because, see, this is where I focus from, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this white dude, you know what I'm saying? It's 1930. You know what I'm saying? So white people are really feeling themselves. You know what I'm saying? They got a bunch of machines. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, they've been working on clothes for a while. They really feel like they are better than everybody else on the planet because of the technology that they have. Technology that they have. Technology that they have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they go to Africa and they're hanging out with these um, with these people that live out in the country. You know what I'm saying? Like the jungle is the country, right? These people live in their little huts. Real simple people, you know what I'm saying, worship sun, moon, stars, boom, boom, bam. They, and and he's, con he's conducting this conversation 
with one of the village witch doctors who was also an astrologer, right? And he begins to lay out the stuff that they know. He shows them the map that they have of the sun, moon, and stars of the galaxies. And the white dude is freaking out because he's like, bruh, like your maps are killing our maps. How do you know more than us? Bro, we got telescopes. Like, look look at my bag of machines, bro. I'm white. You're not supposed to know exactly. this. Exactly. How do you know all of this information that we don't know? And the dude said real plain and simple. He was like, first off, he was like, all of our people are from East Africa. We're either from the Sudan or from Egypt, number one. And he was like, and all that our people did was simply walk over. But he was like, but here's the thing, though. He was like, we learned all this information from the ancient ones who we refer to as aliens, UFOs, or what we call as Christians. We know that they're the watches. We know that they're the fallen angels, the Nephilim. So my point is, is this, is that when we look at any civilization throughout world history that had advanced technology, it's usually because of some type of demonic relationship that they've had with the Nephilim. One of the things that the Nephilim have, have done on this side of history, meaning on ADs, side of history is that they stop they stop looking crazy they stop with the cone heads you know what i'm saying and now, it. yeah they refine it and now they look more and more like people um there's a lot of people who are in this whole conspiracy thing and they check out a dude by the name of david ike i i i suggest checking out david ike in low dosage do doses because his stuff is so demonic it's not because He's in the devil words, but he just ain't got no power. And he's checking all the, out all the satanic stuff, mm. and he doesn't have a buffer up. So you got to be prayed up to check out his stuff. But David Icke is one of the leaders in this conversation, at least in the secular world, because um, one of the things that he's always talking about is the fact that the Nephilim uh, can transform into human form. You know what I'm saying? Like they walking around and his videos are hilarious because he thinks that everybody is a reptile. He thinks everybody's a reptilian. He's the dude that's gonna talk about the reptilian thing and the snake eyes and I've seen a video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, yeah that's David Ike, right? Okay. okay. And it, it, it's once again, it's it's um it's it's necessary for us to at least be aware of what he's talking about because mm -hmm. we're Christians. But the thing is is that he he doesn't have the Christ paradigm in mind. So he still, he'll get right to the point and then say something real dumb and just be like, no, David, you completely missed the point. This is all Luciferian. This is satanically driven. And he uses all of that terminology, but he still don't want to add the piece that in order for me to fix this, I need Jesus. But the reason why I'm even mentioning any of this is because and maybe we we won't publish this, but I'll say it on the live broadcast. Portals are opening up. Mm -hmm. Portals mm -hmm. are opening up and stuff is coming out. And I, I think it's Isaiah, the 13th chapter. It talks about how the, okay, hang on. Before I say that, let me say this. And this is why you got to read the book of Jubilees. So, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. And I'll let you, you know what I'm saying, check it out when you get a chance. So here's what happens. The giants... Are on the earth, right? They're killing human beings. Uh, they're teaching human beings. They taught human beings homosexuality. They taught human beings bestiality. They taught human beings uh, the splicing of of genes uh, and the crossbreeding of uh, of species. You know what I'm saying? That's how come that every ancient religion got these funky looking mythological creatures. They ain't that ain't that mythological. This is how come that we got. Uh, a lot of the demons that are worshipped in these false religions are half human, half animal. It's because there were there were literally dudes walking around with like horse legs, like but a like do exactly. There were minotaurs, bro. Now dig this. The Bible says that okay, so a lot of those uh so so God judges the Nephilim. Um he judges the watcher angels. And this this part of the book of Enoch is crazy because this is whenever uh, the Lord took Enoch's spirit out of his body and had him just like flying all around. He was heaven. asking the angel, well, what is this that I see? Yeah, that was when he angels, went to heaven. Why do you want to know this? Ex okay. Exactly. Yeah. But the, uh, he, this, show, this shows you how, how powerful Enoch's ministry was. The watchers, 
the fallen angels actually came to Enoch and they were like, hey, bro, we know we've sinned. We can't even talk to God no more. We can't. We literally cannot like God put this brace on our neck. We can't even look up to heaven. He was like, so here's what we need you to do. We need you to pray for us, man. We need you to intercede to the God of everything on our behalf and ask this dude to forgive us, right? Now, Dick, this, this is going to be especially intriguing to you, uh, having been a music major, right? Gregorian chant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about to get real. Okay. So the Greek word for watchers, right, is egregori, right? Okay. The... Uh, Slavic derivation of the Greek is Gregory, right? It's about to get weird. Gregorian chant, mm. those are the songs that the angels were singing, asking God for forgiveness. That's where Gregorian chant comes from. Yeah, yeah, but, but hang on, hang on, because that's the commercial break, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Coffee conversation. Yeah, ex exactly. And that's why that's because I was like, man, why does this sound so weird? I didn't like it because it was chant, mm -hmm. but hang on, focus cue. So, uh, so the these portals are opening back up because okay, so God judges the watchers, he tells them, he was like, look, y'all are going to be bound in chains and there's darkness, whoop de woo, your life is going to suck. Okay, then he says, then you're going to watch your children kill each other. So there was like this huge war before the flood even broke out where the Nephilim, the giants start killing each other, right? Okay, <clears throat> here's what we got to understand. Demon spirits are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, all right? Okay, so the Nephilim fight each other. Uh, God sends the flood, destroys all those human beings with corrupt DNA, and washes the bodies away of these giants, right? Everybody was killed. That's something that's, 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 that has to be made infallibly clear because you're going to talk to some unsaved people that have studied part of this, and they're going to try to say the reason how come the giants came back. So like in the book of Numbers where it talks about... Uh, 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 Og, the king of Bashan, who was the giant, mm -hmm. they're going to say the reason I come that he existed was because God didn't kill all the giants. No, that's horse crap. And I'll tell you why in a split second. So the flood comes, the only people that were saved, we have to go by what the word says. We stand on this word. It says eight people, Noah and the folk that got on the boat with him and the animals that God told him weren't corrupted, right? The start, you know what I'm saying? the animal kingdom back over with. So they get off of the boat. The book of Jubilees explains how immediately whenever they got off the boat, these disembodied spirits, right, are angry with these humans. They begin to attack these humans, right? So then they come to Noah, they're like, hey, granddad, man, like, dude, I was, you know what I'm saying, just trying, you know, to pick some grapes, man. I'm out here trying to watch your sheep. And I got this demon spirit, you know what I'm saying, going crazy on me, man. We need you to do some praying. So Noah prays to God. God does something that's very interesting. He takes 90% of these Nephilim and lock them up in, in Sheol Hades, mm -hmm. right? Leaves 10%, right? So the demons that we are fighting in this current dispensation is only 10%. You know what I'm saying? And, and and there's a lot of devils loose, bro. Bro, that 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 yeah. But check this out though. Check this out. What does the book of the Revelation say? It says that in the last days they that those unwashed. spirits that are under the earth are gonna be released. Once again, I remind you, this is how come we're talking about discerning the times is, is in the days of Noah. Portals are opening up. Okay? And this is why uh we've been talking about discernment uh for this for the series because the thing is is that these are deceiving spirits and we're entering an age in mankind where we really got to have uh, discernment as Christians because we're going to be confronted with some stuff in this generation that we have to know the spirit of God you know what I'm saying because it's it's literally going to be like life or death because 
we about to see some stuff that ain't no generation seen before. We got to know his spirit first. Exactly. And the best. Well, see, here's the thing about discernment. That's how discernment works. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'll go ahead and I'll say that is, um, and, and I've learned this like literally like two weeks ago. Um, I was looking up discernment in the original Hebrew and the definition for, there are two definitions for the word discern and one is, is the same word for hear in Hebrew. Shema, and then the other one is to know, to know by it, it experiment, ex, 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 to know by experience, ex, ex, experiential. You know what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm saying? You know, the uh, but I couldn't say it. Uh, expert that one mm -hmm. to know by experience. Um, and like what you just said, the reason I come, we got to know the voice of God first. First off, Jesus is the word and the Bible says the strong meat belongs to them who are full age, who by reason of use have had their senses, senses exercised to discern good and evil. So dig this. We talked about the two powers. See the gift of discerning of spirits, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the relic, the revelatory gifts, right? Those are dunamis and they come from the Holy ghost. The, so that is the gift of discerning of spirits. But dig this. We received a certain level of discernment whenever we came to Christ, because as many as believed on his name to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, which is exousia. So whenever we received exousia from Christ, because Christ is the word in the beginning was the word the Word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Wow. I'm hearing this for the first time. The different discernments that we get from Jesus and from the Holy Ghost, because discernment is being able to know the voice of God is 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 literally knowing God by having experience with them. That's how come they're different, because the relationship that the Holy Spirit has with the father is different than the relationship that the son has with the father. So that's how come that they're able to give us different types of discernment. Wow. They address the father in different ways. Because of relational level. Exactly. So that's why, that's how come that there's a certain type of discernment that comes with exousia that's different than what comes with dunamis. And that's how come that people need to read their Bible. The discernment that I work very strong with, right? Pop got dunamis discernment. I got exousia discernment. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that he don't because Pop got it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the discernment that I'm displaying right now is 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 exousia discernment because what it is is that i put in a lot of hours just reading the bible like a comic book you know what i'm saying just just literally just read i wonder i wonder i wonder what the book of numbers says today and just just literally just out of curiosity uh and being inquisitive just studying the word and then what happens is is that the bible says that he hides that word in your heart well what happens is this is that your whole cosmological worldview you know what I'm saying? Your whole cosmological, well, screw worldview, your whole cosmological view, your view of creation, the galaxies, the universe, your view of the universe is now being shaped and molded by absolute truth, by Jesus Christ who created all things. You know what I'm saying? So and now you get to see how it actually is. You see how it actually is. And the biggest thing is it pertains to discernment. You know what's fake when you run into it. So what happens is, is that I, I can talk with, because uh, I was talking with a brother who's African royalty. He's Cameroonian royalty, and he believes a lot of the same. Don't do that. <laughs> See, I, I know you. You okay, Shanice? You all right? Okay, get up. Get up. Get up. See, Uncle Jason just as dirty as I am. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, she, I right, only did it because I know she. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, but yeah, I was. I was, was, was talking. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was right. yeah, embarrassed. The, uh, but yeah, I was talking with a brother who's uh, who's Cameroonian royalty, and he believes a lot of. He knows a lot of the same stuff that that we're talking about, but he knows it devoid of Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. it's so yeah. So see, that's how come we're talking about having the discernment that comes along with the word because what it is is this is that the Bible says what study show thyself approved. A workman in need is not be ashamed. 
Right. Yeah. About no exactly. So what happens is, is that you can be having these kind of conversations with people. And if you don't know the word and you can't rightfully divide the word of truth, then you'll hear that false doctrine and then it'll throw you off. And next thing you know, you know what I'm saying, you're wearing a turban and burning incense, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> and yeah. saying that God is a woman. No, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like people getting into Gnosticism. What I just heard in the Spirit just now is he's saying, the Holy Spirit just said, according to the kind of revelation you receive and the level of relationship that you receive, that dictates who you call upon. Because if demon spirits reveal things to you just like the Holy Spirit revealed things to you, however, according to who you're receiving information from and what kind of information you're receiving it from, because here's the thing, the Holy Spirit can reveal something to me about demon spirits, but then demon spirits can reveal something to me about themselves or demon spirits can try right. to reveal things to me about the Holy Spirit. Right. However, only one of the two is the spirit of truth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So according to who I'm receiving my information from and what I'm receiving my information from, because anytime we receive information, one of the first things that that does is it sparks a desire to now employ other powers beyond it. If you give me one thing, prime example, when you taught me about, um, when you was teaching me about the uh, going over the scale matrices and stuff, mm -hmm. writing those out. Well, that then caused me to look at what you also taught me about sus chords and all those other things because of the revelation that was given to me. It then inspired me to call upon sources that were greater than that mm -hmm. or that were built upon that, what you gave me. Well, whoever I'm getting my information from and what I'm getting my information from is then, it's that force, be it good or evil, that is now the inspiration by which I call upon either one. So if the Holy Spirit is revealing to me all these things, well, then I'm going to refer back to the Bible. Right. And then... In addition to that, I'm then going to get on my face and go to the author of it. Right. If Demon Spirits is revealing stuff to me, I'm going to go and get into all kinds of stuff. Exactly. And whether my natural mind wants to admit it or acknowledge it, you're going to go to the devil in some way, shape, or form at some point in time if that's where you're getting the majority of your information from. But because he's already a deceiver... He's going to say, well, no, it's not me you're talking to. It's this. It's exactly. this religion. It's this, it's that. When really you're talking straight to him and he's talking straight back to you. But it's not until you reach a certain level that he even lets you know that. But by the time you get to that level, you're so bound in it. It's like, okay, well, this is life now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and you, dude, you're, you're completely right. And that's, that's why the, the word says that we have to try every spirit by the spirit. The only pure spirit that exists is the Holy Spirit, and every other uh, spirit, well, they're, they're good spirits. There are other good spirits that come from God, but when we talk about trying the spirit, meaning to distinguish between good and evil, if it ain't a spirit that comes from God, it's a demonic spirit, and it's only by spending time with God and His Holy Spirit that we recognize stuff that's holy and stuff that, that that's, that's unholy, and the thing that, that I can't stress to you enough, you know what I'm saying, people watching the video is, it's not enough to, and Pop said this uh, in the video, in fact, we're about to drop a video tonight, you know what I'm saying, where he says this. He says, in order for the gift of discerning of spirits to really grow in your life, you got to be around somebody who has the gift working in theirs. That's that's really how it how it grows and it manifests. So, and, and my thing about discernment, and the Lord's just said this to me, it's very important that you develop the discernment where you, it's important that you read a lot of the Bible, but that's still not enough because Jesus said that the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. You know what I'm saying? So it's very important that, 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 that you, uh, that you have a marriage of the, the knowledge, a thorough knowledge of the word, but the Holy Spirit enlivening that word 
breathing the breath of life upon that word so that so that now is real because what's funny is the more and more you check out these videos regarding the Nephilim, you know what I'm saying, the UFO phenomena as a and the giants, everybody uses the Bible as source material. Everybody. And the reason why they it is because they have to, because God created everything by Jesus Christ, so everybody has to reference the Word of God in some shape, form, or fashion. But once again, the Bible says that we have to try each spirit, because there are many spirits that are gone, many spirits that are gone out of the world, and we know that the spirit of the Antichrist is going out into the world. I almost posted this earlier, but the, the spirit told me to, to wait. But I can talk with you guys about it. You know what I'm saying? The reason I come that so many Christians are dibbling and dabbling into astrology is because the pastors ain't teaching about the Maseroth. You know what I'm saying? The So here's what the Maseroth is. The Maseroth is the original, uh, is, is God's opinion concerning the constellations and the stars. I and, need and, this because I was starting to. Yeah, inquis inquire into that. Yeah, it's a real good video by Chuck Misley where he's talking about the constellations, and he's talking about the zodiac and their original intent, because the the word Maseroth is only used one time in Scripture. It's in the Book of Job, and basically, the concept behind the 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 constellations is this: each constellation, when you study the picture behind it, it tells you either about the birth, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every all 12 of them, because remember, 12 is the, is the number of order mm -hmm. in government. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So each constellation tells you a specific part of the gospel. But Satan, and see, this is where these watchers come in. These watchers came in, and they start looking up at the stars, and they were like, yeah, whenever you see that constellation, worship my cousin over here. When you see that constellation, that's mine. I like that one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Worship me. You know what I'm saying? And they screwed it all up, and, and that's... It, once again, Satan is a loser. I'm saying he 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 detracts, but yeah, man. Er, yeah, you got it. They take your eyes off of the actual original intent. Yeah. They have to, just like you were saying with how all these other religions have to still deal with the Bible to a certain extent. Right. They have to deal with certain things because they can't create anything. Exactly. Yeah, they can not only the source material. manipulate, yeah. distort, and pervert what already exists. Exactly. So they still have to use pieces of the truth in order to tell you a lie. Because a lie in and of itself cannot live, breathe. It doesn't have anything if it's by itself. Exactly. If it's by itself, then it ain't even by itself because it can't even exist. Get speaking to that point, and 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 once again, this is why, this is why the church is being called to an even greater level of discernment, because dig this, the Catholic Church right now in the mountains in uh, in Arizona is or is it Colorado? Um, they have uh, this huge telescope. Uh, yeah, this yeah with the with the lens they call it the Lucifer telescope, and what they're doing it's not Utah. is it might be Utah. I just know it's somewhere out west. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the thing. It's like I was dealing with this, like I was telling I was telling Pop man. You know what I'm saying? Like I had to repent because I really did, man. Like I parked in 2013. I I came out of masonry, right? I came mm -hmm. I came out of really talking about masonry, and then I started talking about racism, and that much I was right, but the thing was was that I parked and I'll say it colloquially, but I parked on white people. You know what I'm saying? Because around this time, whenever I was making the transition out of Mason, like the Lord was hipping me to a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about now. You know what I'm saying? But it was just so uncomfortable making that transition. You know what I'm saying? I just parked where it was comfortable. I was like, okay, well, we're gonna talk about white supremacy. I got that. You know what I'm saying? I got that. But it was like, nah. Because it's it's an overarching thing. See, first off, here's why here's why racial strife and division exists. Because the Nephilim were different colors. You know what I'm saying? Dig this. The Romans, they know, they or they they believe that Rome was created by two twin giants, Remus and Romulus. Yeah. Well, guess what nationality they appeared to be if they if they built Rome? 
they had to have been white. The Egyptians, right? Everything about ancient Egypt, ancient Kush, you know what I'm saying, the Sudan, were built by Nephilim that were black. We know th throughout the Bible that the Nephilim that that uh, that were in present day Palestine that they were sim that they were Semitic looking. In fact, thank you, Lord. So dig this. Here's what you got to read in the book of J Jubilees. So after the flood, after God killed everybody, there was this idiot who was one of Shem's grandchildren. He's walking one day, right? Because, you know what I'm saying? After the mount, after the boat rested in Mount Ararat, there's nobody else on the planet. You know what I'm saying? So if you go for a walk, you can run into a lot of really crazy stuff, right? Because all of these things that existed uh before the flood they still exist you know what i'm saying meaning like you know like buildings and stuff mm -hmm. they still exist it's just the people ain't there anymore so this idiot he's walking one day and he run he rolls across what we would consider to be hieroglyphs of cuneiform he sees these demonic depictions he basically sees a bunch of spells written on the side of a rock and instead of running back to the boat and saying, Granddad, I done saw this huge stone with all of the stuff from the world before that got everybody killed. You know, this idiot sat down and transcribed everything. That's how the giants got back on the planet because he literally transcribed the formula, you know what I'm saying, on that how to call back on demons. Exactly. So now, so that's Gen that's Genesis 6. We've just covered Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 because they got off the boat in chapter 9. Now let's go into chapter 10 and then, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible so we can pray. Chapter 10, chapter 9 is, it ends with Canaan, the youngest son of Ham, being cursed because Ham was being gay looking at his dad being naked, right? So his youngest son, Canaan, gets cursed. Now, we talked about this in February of this year where we went through the genealogies, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Okay, the Canaanites would present, would today, present the races that represent the Canaanites would be the Chinese, the Japanese, all of the brown Asians, meaning the Laotians, the mm. Thai, you know what I'm saying, the Native Americans, the Eskimos, exactly, Indonesians, yeah. Mm. But essentially, the because uh, the thing is, is that, and we know this by eating their food, Chinese people have to be related to black people. Right. You know what I'm saying? They have to be. Some of right? the most flavorful stuff ever. Exactly. Okay. Right. Well, the thing about the Canaanites was this. when you, And this <laughs> is why you got to read the book oh, of Jubilee. Yeah, bless you. This is why you got to read the book of Jubilees as well, because it explains how God, ex how God wanted to divide the earth up between the uh, the sons of Noah. God said he was like, hey, he was like, I want Ham to get all of Africa. He was like, I want Yefeth to get Europe. He was like, I want, well, hang on, let me let me go back. My fault, Lord. He said he wanted Ham to get all of Africa and the, the Asiatic nations. Okay. He said he wanted Yefeb to get Europe. He, and he said he wanted Shem to occupy what is the present day Middle East, right? Okay, so here's what happens. Because Canaan got cursed, right? Meaning that he was supposed to be a slave. And we're going to cover this in February at, at our Black History Program again because I've been shedding. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. The, uh, okay, the those peoples were to be slaves to the sons of Shem and the sons of Yefeth. But here's what they said. They said, bump granddaddy. They said, bump Noah. And they said, bump his God. You know what I'm saying? So that's how come that when we study the Old Testament, the Canaanites are so doggone pagan. They so heathen because they still angry that they were supposed to be servants. Now, because they were, okay, so they get mad at God and Noah. And so whenever they get ready to divide the earth, 
the sons, the Canaanites say, Canaan and all his family, they say, bump granddaddy, bump God, we going and we setting up in present day Israel. They were, I mean, right, right smack dab where God said, I want, I want, and once again, the, the reason why this is important is because uh, just like Stonehenge is important, just like uh, Machu Picchu is important. New Grange. Exactly. Just, these are all geographic portals on the place. These are all trans-dimensional portals that the that that they're they're gateways to the supernatural. You know what I'm saying? And unfortunately, because the church is so doggone far behind, the people in the occult are using these portals more than people who were mm -hmm. saved. Uh, if you notice, every time Moses went to talk to God, what did he do? He climbed a high mountain. And that's the reason why is because those the, the peaks of those mountains are literal are literal gateways. Okay. So Canaan and all them idiots, they decide to go set up shop in the on the greatest and the, the biggest uh, portal on the planet, which is Jerusalem. Right? Okay. So God's looking like, dang, now, you know what I'm saying? Now I got to drive these people out. So this is why Moses had to do what he had to do. Ah, okay. Exactly. That was, yeah, that was what, that was what, Moses wasn't even supposed to do that. Moses was supposed to do something else. But because of that family beef never got resolved, he had to handle that hundreds of years later. Well, <clears throat> one of the stipulations in the contract that God made with Noah and his sons was that they were supposed to spread out. So the concept of metropolitan cities, right, where there's a lot of oppression, there's a lot of overcrowding, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of poverty, etc. Ain't even supposed, ain't supposed to exist to be. because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. There's plenty of space on the planet for everybody to have 40 acres and a mule. Still so much is uninhabited. Exactly. But these idiots decided, no, nah, we're just going to disobey what God said and we're going to build cities. Now, here's one important thing that you got to understand about Nimrod. And the Bible says this. When it talks about Nimrod, it talks about how he was a mighty man. Anytime you see mighty man, because the Bible says the giants were mighty men of old and men of renown. You're talking about Nephilim. But because we've just recently copied a copy of the Septuagint, which is, and I, I suggest everybody get a copy of the Septuagint because this version of the Bible comes, this is the Hebrew Masoretic text. All just to, just to say it as quickly as possible, this is a younger version than the Septuagint. So you need Septuagint because that's older and that's got more funk, original Hebraic funk in it. So what the <laughs> Septuagint says is that that Nimrod was a giant hunter before God. And the reason why he was a giant hunter before God was dig this. He, uh, Cush, the Book of Jasher says that Cush stole the garments of fur that God made for Adam and Eve whenever they were butt naked. Mm -hmm. You remember how God slew the animal and gave him some clothes? Well, those clothes were passed down from generation to generation. They were supposed to go to Shem. Well, Ham decided, shoot, you're going to call my son Curse? Shoot, I'm taking everything. And he took the dog on coats and gave them to his son Cush, who eventually gave him to Nimrod. Whenever Nimrod put the clothes on, he beca he had superpowers. And because giants were still uh, in the earth, you got that one? The, uh, and because giants were still in the earth, Nimrod was just able to break these giants off. Like, you know what I'm saying? He had superpowers. Okay, but here's the problem. First off, he acquired the uh he acquired the stuff the wrong way. Then he wouldn't leave that paganism alone. So the very thing that he was called and commissioned to do to help, he ended up getting corrupt. And then Nimrod, as we know in Genesis chapter 10, goes on to found the, you know what I'm saying, the city of Babylon, where he unified all of his cousins together. So that's why they did all that dumb stuff. You got power, but it's the wrong kind of power. You misappropriate power. You abuse power. And then you do dumb stuff with a lot of power. But then God, with the ultimate power to have it, you know. Exactly. And when we talk about the Tower of Babel, we have to be specific. The Tower of Babel was 
a, a Stargate, a trans-dimensional portal. They 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 built a fake Jacob's Ladder. You know what I'm saying? They built their own little gateway so that they could call the demon spirits from the second heaven to and fro, back and forth for the earth. Nimrod was the first antichrist. He was the first person. I, you know, I've been saying this for years. He was the first person to unify the world under a satanically ruled regime. You know what I'm saying? So this is how come that the Bible says that before, because check this out. Nimrod, excuse me, Noah was still alive when Nimrod was doing all of this. So whenever the Bible says that as in the days of Noah, you know what I'm saying, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, that literally means anytime you open your Bible and Noah is alive, you know what I'm saying, you, you got to, that all of that applies. So we're literally, when you study what the United Nations is doing, you know what I'm saying, when you when you recognize that that this current system of white supremacy, because and the only reason why it's white supremacy once again is because white people have made a pact with the white Nephilim. That's all it boils down to. And the reason I come to we know that there are different racial distinctions with the Nephilim is we can look at the pillars, right? So dig, if you look at those Olmec, uh, those Olmec heads in Central and South America, they look like us. You know what I'm saying? Like I got a big old Negroid nose. So you see these statues of these, uh, these stone pillars that are like 800, 900 pounds. You know what I'm saying? Like they're just as wide as that wall behind you guys. And it, it's a black man. It looks like a black man. Well, that's why. It's because each, each, uh, each son of Noah, whether it was a black man, a light-skinned man, or a white man, was deceived by these watchers. And they developed these false religious systems where they were not only worshiping the principalities and powers, the watchers, but they were actually... Uh, worshiping their offspring, the giants. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the Spanish conquistadors. Whenever mm -hmm. you know, what I'm saying, whenever they came and was uh, dealing with the Aztecs and Incas before they killed them all, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. actually found places uh, where there were huge uh, skeletons of giants. And the doggone indigenous people. This is how come that witchcraft is hilarious because they they do so much of the same stuff. That's how come you got to study your Bible. Let me let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, pay attention to this. The Bible says that Michael had to beat Satan's behind because he wanted Moses' bones. Now here, so so the thing is, is that. We know that there's power. Let me tell you what happened to me while I was in China. I was sitting and reading the book on Chinese calligraphy, right? And I just opened it up to the very first page, the very first letter, and I don't even remember what the letter was. And I was just looking at it. And just as, you know, I'm just, just sitting, you know, I'm laying on the couch. I got the book on my chest. I was like, that looks like a spirit. And the Lord was like, look it up. So I look it up. Come to find out, and this is how come that God, and, and when you study those books, like the book of Enoch says that these, these fallen angels taught mankind writing. Mm -hmm. God don't want people to be literate. How's he the word and he don't want you to read? It's not that God don't want you to read. He don't want you to read the stuff that Satan wants you to read. You know what I'm saying? It's the devil books he don't want you to read. Chinese calligraphy came about like this. The, uh, the Nephilim taught Chinese people to take bones from from goats, cows, pigs, right? And then they would take the fat and they would put they would they would bathe the bones in that fat. Then they would take the uh, the bones and throw them in fire and then the bones would crack. And then the the different shapes that the cracks would make, that's how the Chinese letters came about. That's why they looked that way. Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs came about different. Egyptian hieroglyphs are pictographs, right? Mm -hmm. First off, when we think about the original language, which is Hebrew, and see, this is why this is important when we talk about the Tower of Babel, because everybody was speaking, the Book of Jubilees says this, everybody was speaking Hebrew down before to God, ex yeah, down to the animals, before God split up the languages. Everybody was speaking Hebrew. Okay, now here, uh, here lies the problem. Whenever people start dealing with their different languages, this is, you know what I'm saying, this, this gets back into the piece about how mankind got thrown off. Okay, uh, 
Now these Chinese people, for example, they're speaking their languages. Well, guess what? Demons are uh, are teaching them, you know what I'm saying, how to write. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Whenever you study uh, uh, ancient Mesopotamian uh, cuneiform, it's the exact same concept. You know what I'm saying? People are learning how to read and write uh, from... Uh, from demon spirits, so I, I think I think I'll just close off right there because this, it, you're yeah, saying this is something. Yeah, I can just yeah, keep, you can going. keep going. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's 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 entailed. It's it's like so many gaps in knowledge have mm -hmm. been filled in. Things make more and more sense that, that I've studied and had parts of it. One one about this and one about that. So, okay, now this makes sense. Um, this is the reason why we've been misdirected through society with Darwinism. Uh, I'll give this real quick example. Then we'll pray. Um, on Facebook, there have been some pictures of giants where they unearthed them. Because I tell people, uh, archaeology is a relatively young language, uh, science. It's only a little over 100 years old. But they're unearthing things all the time. And um, one of my nieces in Ohio, she put up a picture I seen prior to that. So I just put real quick, this debunks uh, Darwinism. I, took, I said, go to Genesis. I said, I always believe it's Genesis 6. Chapter, you know, Genesis, get it right. Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. I said, it tells you about, the Bible says there were giants in the land. And, you know, it says it. That, that those fallen angels saw that the women were fair. They looked attractive. They said, I want one for wives. And so they turned themselves into men and had sex with them. And they were the offspring. But see, it's in the scripture, but folk won't touch it. They won't talk about it. And so there are other things in scripture, preachers never touch on it, and people have no idea. But, you know, more and more of that knowledge is coming back. Mm -hmm. And we have to pay attention to it because it makes other things make sense. And you know, those are the things we want people to understand. Um, the word is true. It is not allegory. It's not metaphor. People trying to take that, take it that way. But uh, the word is literal. God is real. His power is real. But it's predicated not on having religion, but a relationship. So uh, we're going to call on the God of the relationship now and whatever it is that you need, regardless of what it is you deem your life, Jesus was sent here for salvation. The salvation means healing in every area of your life. Um, but you have to believe it. Again, the only part of the Bible that's going to help you is the part that you believe. So you need to believe it. If you haven't believed it, you need to believe it. It's that little, it's that real. And the God of all comfort will touch you. Father, again, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. And we thank you for the validity of your word. Lord, I believe that some people's eyes have opened up and curiosity has been piqued. Even some that have been skeptical about certain things, Lord. I pray that they take, they, they fall back, Lord, and take a renewed interest in the word. I pray that people will just go simply to Genesis 6. Sixth chapter, Lord, and, and just read down through nine and let them begin to understand that there were literal giants in the land. Lord, you, you said things in your word that people still don't want to believe. Lord, I pray that faith will ensue and that people will come to the realization that everything in the Bible is real, that you can't pick and choose what you want to believe. Father, I pray even now for more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And Lord, I know that your son was born during the, really during the Feast of Tabernacles. But as Paul said, if they're talking about Jesus, then I feel that it's something good. We're at that time now, Lord, that the world stops and thinks about Jesus. So Lord, I pray that somebody during this time will call on his name and recognize that he is the savior of the world. 
and that they will give his life or her life to him. Lord, I pray that those who are hurt, who are lonely, who are suffering, will call upon that name, Father, the name that you have lifted above every name, the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, the name of Joshua, the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, <coughs> would touch them and bring that salvation in every area of their lives, Lord. I pray that people touch this week. And Father, I ask about Sandra Omen in here to be so dope. Rebbe de ma sondo ushir da da ba sendra maro do. Rebbe de ma omen in de ma sondo ushir de si ma. Rebbe de ashmara de sendra omen in de ma sondo. Rebbe de oshibara de sendra maro do de omen in de ma. Rebbe de oshmira da ra tabara do de ospara de sendra o ma sondo. Rebbe de oshimara de ra timir de ma sondo omena. And Father, I pray, Lord, that we'll be able, Lord, to, to have that love, Lord, and to be able to forgive people when they have wronged us, Lord, or they've done wrong throughout the body. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to ask you, Lord, if that person has sinned, Lord, help us to forgive them. But I also pray, Lord, even if that person has done wrong, I pray that you will speak to individuals and let them know that there are times when that person has gotten it right with you and that you have forgiven them. And that we are not to man out judgment. You are the righteous judge, Lord, not us. Help us to have that real love and unity in the body of Christ. Father, I pray again, Lord, that those who are like-minded, Lord, let us come together. Lord, I pray, Lord, you have a plan, Lord, for this, this city and this region. And Lord, your plans, you haven't changed your plans. Man has just not carried out your plans. But I pray you speak to women and speak to men and speak to children. Speak to those, Lord, who are tired of the same old mess in church. Let Ishimara do Sinra Omason do Ushimara Derdo, Rodo Oshmeri, the Sindra Marado de Besande, Eshiri, the Sandra Omanindia de Besada. Father, I pray, Rada Samara Dero to Misundo Oshiri de Sande. Father, I bind every principality and power. Every rule of darkness, every wicked spirit in high places, Lord. Father, I pray that the veil be pulled back, Lord, that people will be able to peer into the realm of the spirit. And Lord, I pray, Lord, when they do that, they'll have holy boldness. And that they will speak the word, Lord, to their circumstances, Lord, as well as the circumstances of others. I pray that I smile this mundo oshmeri de sindra marado. Rodo oshimara de sindra marado de basande. Ishmeri de Sindra Marado Basande. Ishmeridor and Asmara de Rada. Well, I pray that people will begin to have dreams, Lord, in the night season. Lord, let them Ishmara de Sandra Marado Basande. Let them understand the dreams, Lord. I pray that they will be able to interpret what it is that you are showing to them, Lord. In each shot, so by Sandra Oshmara de Sandra, though. Help those, Lord, who have the visions, Lord, the open visions, Lord or within the inner witness, Lord, that those visions. Help the Lord not only see things, Lord, but help them understand what they are seeing. Lord, this is, this is, these are the last days. And it is the time of Job 2, 28, 29 throughout, Lord. It is a time when man needs to Ishmara do Sindra Oman and the Abansado. Rodo Oshmeri de Sindra Ba. Ishmara do Sindra Erada. Rodo Oshmeri do Drasmari de Oto. Rodo Oshimara de Sindraba, Eshere de Sindraba, Rodo Oshmara de Timisundo, Eshmira Dondra Omen in the Erdibia, Robananda Eshmira do Sandrada, Eshmira de Sindra Amara de Basoro, Robiana Basande. Father, I plead the blood over every job, Lord, that people are going to next week. Eshmira de Basondo Oshme, Rodo Omen in the Erdo Basoro, Oshmira de Sandra Marasoro, Robiana de Ospira Dandra. And Lord, even as we are ending this 12-month calendar year, Lord, and we are moving into the next one, Lord, as we move to this next Gregorian year, Lord, we are still in pursuit. We are still in the midst of recovery. 
Ishmira do Sira da Sendra Maradodo, Rodoman in the Ero Tibisondo, Rodo Oshmira da Saba, Robin in the Osmara de Ero Tibisondo, Ishmira de Sendra Maradosa, Robin in the Besendo Oshira Dada, Ishmira da Sandra Oman in the Ero Tibisi, Ishmira de Sira da Sondo, Rodo Oshmira de Sabaradodo, Rodo Oshira de Sindrama, Robin in the Ero Tibisandrado, Ishmira de Sindra Maradodo, Robin in the Oshmira da Sande. Father, I bind every issue, Lord, out of a Sunday, every chair, every spill, every incantation, Lord. I bind those, Lord, that go to the high places. I bind with this, the barrel, Lord, of a Sunday. Yes, Mary, the syndrome on in the other week. Robert, the other center, oh, Mary, down of a Sunday. Yes, Mary, the syndrome on in the other week. Robert de Besundo O Shiro do Soma, Rodo O Shimara de O Tibisundo Be, Rodo Mono to Basendra Oman India, Rodo Beandro Oman India de Besundo, Eshmere de Sindra Oman de Besodo, Ro Oman India de Besada, Eshmara de Besande, Father continues to confound and confuse them. Rodo Mono de Sandra Oman India, Rodo O Shimere de Sindra Marado, Eshmere de Sindra Maro de Sarado, Roman India de Besundo O Shiro Dada, Resimera da Sandra O Shima, Robe de de Besenda O Shiri de Sande, Ishmere de Sandra Ma, Roda Menenda O Shmere de Sende, Ishmere de Sindra Marado de Besande. The Lord, we bind those Lord who have the spirit of competition, Lord, and that they are full of malice, greed, envy. We bind these individuals, Lord, and we command Ishira de Sara do Sende, O Shmere do Sunda Umla. Roman in the Eshmere de Sende, Eshmere do Sora dasa, Roman in the Eshmere de Sende, Eshmere Torada Andida, Eshmaradora de Sindra Maradodo, Rosmere de Sindra Masodo, Eshmere de Sindra Ma, Roman in the Ode And Father, we thank you, Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory, Lord, for the moving and leading of your spirit. Father, continue to move in miracles, signs, and wonders, and show this world, Lord, that Jehovah still reigns. Ishmara do Sira de Sindhade, Roman in the de Bisundo O Shirada, Rada and Chandra de Sundo, Roman in the air de Bisundo, Osha Tarada Sande Obana, Roman in the air de Bisundo Ba, Roda O Shira de Sindhada. Red Spirit and Jeroboam Sodo. Mm. Father, we be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. Oshmara de Sandra Masodo, Oshmara de Adabasande. For all the glory is thine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.